Welcome to chapter eight. In this chapter, we will talk about decent work. Uh, it's part of part four, and it's the only chapter in part four of the book. And it's the first part of the book where we actually talk about outcomes for employees, which is a bit weird if you think about it, it's since the entire book is about human resource management, so it's about people. But in the previous chapters, it was always about employee motivation, employee productivity, employee you know, characteristics that organizations need and need to take into account. In this final chapter, I will pay attention purely to the outcomes of human resource management for people's lives. So, decent work. After this clip, you will understand why a separate section on the worker's perspective is needed and what human resource management can do to bring about a good quality life for people, but also how human resource management can, can sometimes harm individuals. I will explain what decent work is and why we could perceive it as a minimum standard of good quality work. Um, I will also show some research evidence for the dimensions of, uh, of decent work and I will also raise the debate whether decent work is actually a theory or a policy. So let's have a look at uh, outcomes for employees. So what makes life good? What is the quality of life? If you ask the word health work if you ask the World Health Organization, they will say that a good quality of life constitutes of being healthy, so feeling well, no diseases, of having um, a good social network, being happy with your family and friends, having time to enjoy them, um, and finally to feel mentally well, so feel happy in general. Individuals are perfectly capable to indicate how they perceive their stand on the ladder when it comes to quality of life. So the picture you see here is part of the uh, World Health Organization's questionnaire uh, investigating um, how people rate their quality of life when it comes to their own health, uh, social well-being and uh, psychological well-being. So are they li li living at this moment the worst possible life or the best possible life? And of course, you can try to understand uh, with statistics which people are relatively better off. So who perceive, the, who are the people who perceive their lives to be relatively good and who are the people who perceive their lives to be really bad. And bottom line, it brings to us to a view like this. So it's called a systems model. That means that your quality of life depends on where you live in the world. It uh, depends on your demographic characteristics. It uh, depends on uh, your country's um, environment. And a lot of things that close by also impact within countries, within the system, how you, uh, how you feel, how you score on the definitions of physical, mental, and relational or social health. Um, as you can see, family and friends are important. Your community is important. Your education. Uh, whether or not you're part of a religi religious community, and work. Work is one of the things here, but if you look at it, at it in a closer way, you will realize that work actually will impact all of the other domains as well. For example, if you have a job that forces you to work over 60 hours a week, how much time will be left for family and friends? So work is one of the things that is really essential in the realization for a, of a good quality of life for individuals. So work is a central part of our lives. And I have a few examples of authors and literature that explicates how important work actually is. I like this one by William Faulkner, Nobel Prize winning author. And he claims that one of the saddest, saddest things is that the only thing men can do for eight hours a day, day after day, is work. You can't eat for eight hours a day, nor drink for eight hours a day, nor make love for eight hours a day. All you can do for eight hours a day is work. Which is the reason why man makes himself and everybody else so miserable and unhappy. So this quote kind of already demonstrates that there is Maybe joy, but also a lot of frustration in work that is maybe detrimental to the quality of life. Another example that uh, provides an example of why work can be devastating. 
So uh, I picked this one, is a poem from a, a collection of worker poems from um, workers in Chinese factories. So these are people that lived in the countryside before and they moved to these big cities to work in, um, uh, in factories, uh, making long hours, um, the, being really like a commodity rather than a person. Um, this poem that I'll read in a second is a suicide note. It's of this uh, Li Xueng, and he, is, uh, he came from the countryside to a big Chinese city with the dream to do something with literature, to, to be um, in the library. So, um, but he didn't find any time to work on his career and his ambitions, and he felt more and more depressed, and it ended in, uh, in his uh, suicide. So the poem is, uh, is clear about, the, about this condition and is related to work. So it reads, I swallowed an iron moon. They called it a screw. I swallowed industrial wastewater and unemployment forms, bent over machines. Our youth died young. I swallowed labor, I swallowed poverty, swallowed pedestrian bridges, swallowed this rusted out life. I can't swallow anymore. Everything I've swallowed rolls up in my throat. I spread across my country a poem of shame. This is what work can do. I'm going to end in a more positive note. Work can also be a source of joy. So this saying is contributed to Confucius. Uh, it's hard to verify if it's true, but there are many sources on the internet that say it's, it's a quote by Confucius. Uh, who claims to, to have said that if you choose a job you love, you'll find that you will never have to work a single day of your life. So there are two ends of the extreme, illustrating what work can do to individuals. It can be a source of unhappiness and it can be a source of happiness. So it can be both. Now to human resource management. What can human resource management do to make the employee outcomes a little bit more positive than the suicide note side. What we can distinguish in human resource management is the so-called high road, the low road, and I'm going to make a plea for the decent road. The high road is the road where everybody is extremely happy. You do a job that you love, you never need to work a single life, and human resource management has 100% facilitated that. The low road these are the examples of, of exploitation. It's the picture you see here is child labor, and this kid should go to school, right? So in a little bit more detail, the two extremes when it comes to human resource management, on the one hand, ex uh, investing in employees, make sure that works provide social relations, that you can make friends, that there's room for personal growth and development, that you can work on your strengths and that you can do the things you like, um, that you have decision latitude, that you can organize your own work and that you can do the things that you're good at. Um, in those kind of human resource management systems, work will bring engagement, they will bring motivation and they will bring well-being to employees. In the low roads, this is characterized by uh, employer uh, using people as means to make production. <clears throat> In low road, there are no investments in, in people, low wages. And the work provides nothing except for very precarious work conditions, uh, very long hours, um, unsafe conditions. So safety, as you can, uh, could see in the picture before, um, no regard for the well-being of, of, or the health of employees. And for sure, the pay is also not good. In this case, work can lead to exploitation. And exploited people, they are, uh, they, are, they are exhausted. They don't have the power to get out of this situation anymore, which includes a load of health risks. So these two extremes, uh, you could read from the HRM literature. Uh, the question is, are all employers capable of offering this high road and making sure that there is this wonderful environment where everybody's nice and that you can combine work and private life? Well, the answer is probably no, unfortunately, but we need to set 
uh, to mark somewhere between this high and this low road. And one attempt there is to mark the decent road. So what is the least organization should do to ensure that their workers have a decent life, so a decent quality of life? The decent road is characterized by the following. Decent jobs are those that provide men and women with opportunities to obtain work that allows earning a decent income under conditions of freedom, equity, security, and human dignity. So these words, I will explicate them a little bit later, but it means that there is uh, your value for who you are. Um, you can go uh, and leave the job if you like. You are treated like the others. There is a safe environment um, and you're treated with human dignity. So you're not a means, but the organization values you as a person. Decent work is seen as the minimal standard for work conditions that allow a good quality life. And it's not something that we just invented here. It's actually something that is promoted by the United Nations. So if you know the Sustainable Development Goals, and then the eighth one of that is called uh, Decent Work and Economic Growth. Um, and it says literally to promote the inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and decent work for all. So there's a strong belief that when uh, countries across the globe invest in decent work for their population, for their working population, that will eventually bring benefits to countries as well. So why, why does decent work, uh, decent work and economic growth matter? The, the claim of the United Nations is the following. Sustained and inclusive economic growth can drive progress create decent jobs for all, and improve living standards. So there, they, they see this clear connection between offering decent jobs and the quality of work. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, acknowledges this and sees it as a way out of poverty. So full and productive employment and decent work for all, including women and young people, is the most effective route out of poverty. The good thing for human resource management is, it, is that it kind of gives you a, uh, a route map how to address these minimal standards it, by taking a worker-centered worker perspective. So what I will do in the next slide is ex explicate what, uh, what decent work is, which dimensions there are, and which one are under the, under the influence of an organization and which one are maybe uh, more under the influence spheres of a society. So decent work, who is responsible? Uh, there are two key actors who can uh, contribute to decent work, and these are the ones that oversee work. So at the highest level, um, the state has a role. So especially when it comes to availability of decent work, uh, regulations, uh, social security, um, a national uh, negotiations with, uh, with representatives of, uh, of workers. This is something that should be organized at the national level. However, at the organization or on the job level, there are responsibilities for managers who can look after the quality of work conditions. So let me dive into those two uh, levels. So at the nav national level, uh, first and foremost, the opportunities to work. So is it possible for everybody who wants to work to obtain work? Uh, this has to do with uh, labor market policies, it making sure that people with a distance for, to a labor market, for example, are uh, promoted, that, uh, employ that, that they become attractive for uh, employers. Uh, it has to do with, uh, with uh, combating youth unemployment. So opportunities for work. The second one, basic human rights, this has to do with following up labor law. So abolish all the work that has been objected in international conventions on basic human rights. What does it mean? Fight slavery. Make sure that people are not kept at their jobs by taking away their passports. It sounds really uh, like a far away nightmare. But we are aware that these kind of conditions also in uh, modern Western countries still exist. So fight those. 
The third dimension is social security. What happens if somebody uh, turns ill when the main income provider of a family turns sick? So which regulations does a, does a country have to protect workers against different contingencies of life, such as the old age, pensions, uh, disability, uh, the death of the breadwinner, and, and also unemployment. So these things are not human resource management. These things are, uh, they need management, so to speak, but then on a higher level, on a state level, or even maybe on a European level. So just a few examples to, uh, to, to illustrate how important these things are. Uh, South Africa is still suffering from a huge youth unemployment and also this uh, is, uh, is mentioned as one of the reasons why there are still so many uh, conflicts and societal uh, tensions happening. Uh, the example in the right upper corner about social security, what happens if you, if you, if you turn ill, if you become disabled for some reason? So do you still have an income? Can you still work? Um, and also the reports, of course, for, for uh, uh, especially migrants, they are a particularly vulnerable group when it comes to um, this, this, these terrible work conditions and slavery. Um, so reports from the Middle East about slave camps in uh, Libya, they are known and it's very difficult to combat. So. This is on the state level. Let's turn to the company level. So at the company level, there are... If, uh, five dimensions of decent work where uh, human resource management can create a, a good quality life for employees. So we have productive work, equity in work, dignity at work, security at work, and the social dialogue. And I'll explain briefly what each of these are, and you can also read in the book. So productive work means that you have a job that provides you with sufficient income to live a decent life. So if you, your job, uh, provides you with an income which is insufficient, for example, to pay the rent or to, uh, you know, to buy the food, then your work is not productive and then it's not a decent job. There are instances where people have to combine multiple small jobs in order to have a sufficient income. In the perspective of a decent work agenda, these are undesirable jobs. So part-time working is only okay when it, is, when it still leads to sufficient income to, uh, to workers. Equity in work has to do, to do with discrimination. So we discussed this in, uh, in, in chapter seven when we talked about the first diversity and inclusion. So basically everything there, make sure that people feel included and not excluded. Dignity at work means that the employer acknowledges that employees have a life outside work and that they have time to enjoy that life and that they have the opportunity to sometimes be a little bit flexible about the working times. For, for example, to, uh, um, to take care of a sick child. Security at work has to do with safety. So organizations need to make sure that the work environment is safe. And finally, social dialogue means that employers should organize that employees have a voice in the organization. So this uh, refers back to chapter six, where we talked about the uh, power of workers. This is recognized as one of the conditions for a decent work environment. So to come back uh, to uh, the decent work and quality of life from the highest level, for, so the national, what, what can countries do? Uh, there's a lot of research evidence why this is important. Um, as we know from research, as being unemployed leads to definitely a lower quality of life. It is being reported that people feel uh, that they have less value, that they have uh, all kinds of mental pro they develop mental pro problems. And uh, being unemployed is also shown to relate to more unhealthy uh, behaviors. The basic human rights, there's, uh, of course, it's very difficult to do research to, um, into really uh, these people who are trafficked for, for sex work, for example, or for uh, or be used as slaves. It's really difficult to, to, to research populations, but we know that these people are extremely vulnerable and that it leads to all kinds of mental health issues. 
apart from, uh, from people who have been abused, of course, can also have uh, uh, physical uh, problems. Social security is, uh, it was obvious that uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, those countries who had a social security system that helped people to survive when everything was in a lockdown, they performed better eventually than countries that, who did not have so. So having some social security is really important to, uh, to keep uh, a good level of national uh, stability. There is also plenty of research evidence for the quality of work dimensions that happen in organizations. So for productive work, equality in work, dignity at work, security at work, and social dialogue, we have abundant evidence that all of these are important to employee well-being. I refer to the book to have a closer look at these. So finally, what do we know? What is this decent work agenda? Uh, we know that decent work and the dimensions based on scientific evidence is important for the quality of life. So we know that the dimensions of decent work are valuable, they are well chosen. I want to make one important note. It's not a theory as such. So it, has, it is the outcome of a long debate across countries, between countries. Uh, so you can imagine there's a lot of politics and policy making and debate involved in the definition of all the, of the, all the dimensions. So for sure, yes, it's informed by theories and there is plenty of evidence. And of course there are moral considerations why the decent work agenda is important. But remember, it is not a theory. What we need to understand why the dimensions are important, we need to use additional theories. And these theories have informed the decent work agenda. And in the next clips, I will talk about stress theory and I'll also talk about the moral perspectives of work that also uh, are part of the decent work uh, agenda. So we are the, at the end of the clip. So by now you know why work matters for the quality of life of individuals and that human resource management can have multiple forms and it can be exploitative and it can be ugly. Uh, United Nations are promoting decent work to advance quality of life work worldwide and they use the vehicle of decent work as the minimum standard of work that allows for a decent life. There are eight dimensions, which, of which three more refer to national systems, national policies, policies, and five directly relate to human resource management and organizations. There's an abundance of research evidence that these dimensions bring better quality of life. However, remember, decent work is a policy framework and it's not a theory as such. Thank you.